Welcome to another episode. Uh, let me just begin by saying thank you very much for uh, supporting this channel and for keeping me in your subscribers list. I received a question from one of our viewers some time ago, probably a year ago, and I completely forgot about it until recently. And uh, I was reminded recently that this person had asked the question almost a year ago, or probably more than a year ago. Probably the reason was also that we were in uh, the state of lockdown, and therefore I forgot about it. But uh, since he has asked, I think it's all fair if I were to answer, or at least try to answer. Now the question he asked is quite interesting. He was asking, how do we situate the position of Islam in politics today? Because there is so much misuse and abuse of the religion of Islam in politics today, and the link, while subtle, is clear in these past decades that the abuse of the religion of Islam has stunted our development. Is there anything that could help us better understand how to resuscitate the true and rightful place of the religion of Islam in politics today? That is a quite an interesting question. <clears throat> and it's interesting that you use the term abuse, because that's exactly what it is. All of this extremism has actually abused the true meaning of the religion of Islam. But back to the question at hand. If you ask the question, when did it permeate, that one you're asking a definite time. Now, I have always mentioned in one of my videos as well that the corruption of knowledge is what began the abuse of the religion of Islam and pretty much everything else. Because when you corrupt knowledge, you are corrupting the meaning of it, and therefore you are not putting that knowledge in the rightful place, and therefore it becomes corrupt. Now, when it comes to the religion of Islam and politics in Malaysia, probably the earliest notion we have of this kind of a thing where religion is uh, associated with politics was probably early in the 50s before independence. I mean, of course, before independence, we were a British colony. And then we had all these political organizations that were vying for the people's vote. And of course, the victor in that was UMNO. They came out demanding uh, independence from the British. And of course, the British allowed it with certain conditions. But that didn't end there. It was merely a few years after the establishment of UMNO that factions began to appear within UMNO itself. And these factions ultimately led to the formation of the uh, Prasatwan Islam Sir Malaysia, or PAS. And they decided to go on a platform of religion. And they said that they were going to govern politically using the religion of Islam as their guide. Now, all that was well and good. The problem is that a lot of these people who established that party, that political party, they were or exposed to what was going on in the Middle East prior to that, especially in places like Egypt, where the Muslim Brotherhood was very active at the time. And therefore, they got these ideas from those kind of circles, not just from the Muslim Brotherhood, but also from the, from the Saudis. And their kind of version was what they adopted and brought here. Now, the problem begins, as I said, when you start corrupting knowledge. Now, in this case, what I mean is this. When you start involving the religion of Islam into politics, then you have to understand the religion of Islam first. And what does the religion of Islam emphasize? The religion of Islam emphasizes faith. In other words, the theological part of Islam is emphasized the most, followed by an emphasis on the social fabric. Now, way down the, the priority of emphasis in the religion is the legal issue. And even then, 
the legal issue, while it is not as emphasized as the others, it is still noteworthy in the sense that it is there in place in order to administer the social fabric within a political state properly. But the problem comes when you start thinking that everything has to be reduced to the legal entity. And this, I think, is what happened. Everything started being reduced to become a legal question, whether something was legally allowed or not. And what's worse is that it devolved into the penal code, or what they call the hudud, not really the legal aspect per se. And therefore, I think this is where the problem arises. When you reduce everything to law, you are pushing aside what is more important. And what is what is more important? That is ethics. That is subsumed within the, the purview of faith or theology. Now, this one has been ignored. The question of ethics has been largely ignored in favor of a penal code and in the implementation of legal uh, uh, laws or legal enactments without considering ethics. This is the problem that we face today where we see large numbers of politicians and people who are involved in politics who are um, charged in court for some crime or other and yet the legal team that they employ argues based on the legality of whatever these people are charged with. And most of the time, their legal arguments are valid. Not to say they are sound, but they are valid. Now, that comes another problem, therefore. You are saying, therefore, that legally it is, it is correct legally, but it might not be correct ethically. Why is it then we are not emphasizing the ethical part of it? If you already know that ethically it is wrong, how can you say, therefore, that legally it is right, and therefore there's something wrong with your understanding and interpretation of the legal system in the religion of Islam? Because you ignore ethics. Now, this is actually what has happened in Malaysia, specifically. I mean, we can talk about other countries in the Middle East, all the Muslim countries, we can talk about that as well. But we're not interested, we are only interested in what is happening in this country. And I've been saying for decades, that the problems that we have had is because of the corruption of knowledge and we have corrupted it such that we have reduced everything to the legal entities. More specifically, we are now trying to gear ourselves to direct our attention more to the penal code. That is not going to solve our problems. We have huge political problems, we have huge <coughs> social problems, and yet we are not doing anything about it. We have huge legal problems as well. The judiciary. Don't think that the judiciary, simply because it's supposed to be dispensing with justice, that it is free of corruption of knowledge. They are also uh, part and parcel of this problem. Now herein lies our difficulty. How do we now try to emphasize that which has more of an ethical flavor to it rather than merely looking at the literal legalistic language. This is what we have to overcome. Now, if we are going to do that, then we need to seek out those people, in other words, the scholars who really understand the religion of Islam, really understand ethics, really understand the social fabric when it comes to the religion of Islam and how to treat the social fabric. We need these scholars. But if we are ignoring them, if we are thinking that these scholars are nothing but uh, book smart people, then we are seriously mistaken because now it seems there is a tendency to listen to any Tom, Dick and Harry who has some kind of a uh, charismatic appeal because of the way he talks or the way he speaks. Not for the substance that he is uttering, but for just simply his showmanship. This is what the preacher is, the modern day preacher. They have to have a certain element of, of showmanship, a certain element of uh, of uh, conviviality to the viewer. Not to say that he needs to have substance. That unfortunately is lacking, seriously lacking in the preachers of today, both Muslim as well as non-Muslim. It's just showmanship basically. There is no knowledge or substance behind it. They cannot develop any epistemology. 
They cannot develop any ontology, let alone a cosmology. And here we have the religion of Islam that is described in a world view. We are supposed to understand that. And yet, <laughs> we're still emphasizing the banal, irrelevant issues that plague our society. We are never going to move ahead. We cannot call this development. Now, our viewer, just, our viewer who asked this question, he said, the abuse of the religion of Islam. So he also recognizes that there has been an abuse on the religion of Islam. He's not claiming to be a scholar or anything. He's just perhaps an ordinary viewer. But he himself knows that there has been abuse. And this is what we've been saying, that this abuse has happened thank you to our uh, Muslim brethren who themselves claim to be men of substance when they are not. When they don't know something, they refuse to admit that. And who is the one who suffers in the end? The whole of society suffers. So we need to start thinking now, seek out those people with knowledge, not simply knowledge of the law or the penal code. Knowledge now we are talking about is of ethics and morality. This is what the foundation of the religion of Islam is premised upon, including justice. Now, all of these things, ethics, morality, they all have a basis with justice. Therefore, the scholar is someone who understands justice, who knows how to place things in their proper places within the context of that system. These are the scholars, not some Tom, Dick and Harry who can't develop an epistemology. Now, the fact that he mentions the abuse means there is some form of an extremism. Now, whenever we mention this word extremist or extremism, we are often thinking of someone who is, uh, who is outfitted with the kind of wear or with the kind of clothing that identifies them as extremist. But that doesn't mean that the others who are not identified by their clothing or by their outward appearance are not extremists. That doesn't mean that. Extremism is like a a double-edged or double-sided coin. On the one hand, you have extremism of excess, where you do more than what is prescribed. Then you have the extremism of defect, where you don't, where you don't do enough of what is prescribed. But both of them are extremisms. Both of them are extremist attitudes and behaviors. What we have here in this country is a mixture of both. The one which is extremism of excess, and the other one where there is the extremism of defect. We have a mixture of both of these, and both of these are extremisms. Both of these are involved in the corruption of knowledge. Both of them are responsible for this corruption of knowledge. Therefore, we have to be uh, uh, ourselves educated. We have to also have certain knowledge in order to be able to identify which is which. I think that's all I'd like to say on this uh, subject for, for now but perhaps we'll meet very soon in the future. Thank you very much once again for watching and click that subscribe button.